Good evening, Floss Tube. It's your girl Lori here, also known as Sharky Stitcher on this channel and on Instagram. We talk about cross stitching on this channel, and tonight we're doing something a little bit different. I'm doing a kit with me. So basically, I've got some stuff to kit up, and I need to bobbinate some floss and get some things sorted. And I thought I'd just go ahead and start filming. And then I had posted on Instagram that I was doing this and asked for some questions. That way, it's not just me winding floss and talking about, you know, whatever musings creep into my brain. So, um, yeah, we got some questions to go over. Um, I'm not gonna, this isn't like your typical floss tube, like where it's numbered. Um, I'm not gonna show you all my, my whips. I'm not gonna show you any stash acquisitions or anything like that. Show me, show you any of the progress. I have a few FFOs too, <laughs> but uh, that'll be for the next floss tube that I put up. So stay tuned for that. This one is kind of a proactive thing. Today is, uh, it's close to midnight. It's Wednesday, October, 6th I believe and and um on Sunday the 9th <laughs> I am flying to Austin Texas to get a tattoo and I'll be there for a few days and then I'm flying right back so um I'm flying in on a Sunday and I'm getting there around 9 a.m or so and it's a Sunday, so I've looked into doing some things there. I was kind of hoping to maybe make a field trip down to San Antonio to go see Under the Sea Fabrics. That would be awesome, but they're closed on Sunday. Ah, so sad. But anyways, I've decided um, instead of doing that, um, thought about getting a facial and all that fun stuff, I decided I would bring some stitchy stuff with me and stitch. Now the, the crappy thing is I'm not gonna be able to check into my hotel until like three o'clock or so, but I'm still gonna have that whole day to burn. The next day I'm getting tattooed and I don't know how long we're gonna be doing it for. The next day I'm gonna be getting tattooed as well. Not sure how long we're doing it for again. And then the next day I leave around noon or so. So, and then the flight is like two and a half hours long or so. So I'm wanting to bring some stitching with me, but I gotta keep it small and fairly simplistic and I have to keep in mind that I'm not going to have my iron with me because typically when I stitch, I iron my floss to make it nice and smooth. And that really helps the experience of stitching for me. So I'm having a little bit of a panic, not knowing I'm not going to have my iron with me, though I could bring it with me. And when I say iron, I mean my hair straightener, little travel size one. I could pack that along with me, but of course I can't use it on the plane. I could only use it in my hotel room which might be fine. I haven't decided yet if I'm doing that or not. But anyways, I got a couple little piles of some stitchy stuff um, and I got a few questions to go over too. So um, let's see here. Question number one, I'm gonna answer this question and then show you the first thing I'm kidding up because it kind of ties together. So this is from Kitchy Whips. She asked, when kidding something up, do you already have a possible fabric color in mind or do you go through your stash with a picture of the project? So. That question has several answers. Um, there's a lot of things that go into me choosing fabrics. Number one, I don't really care for neutrals. <laughs> um, I like color. I like the background to be cool. I like multiple colors for the most part. Um, there are a few things that I will stitch on just kind of a basic background, like if I'm doing just this little small like ornament piece or something like that, something fairly simple or something with words, you know, I will pick something simple for that. For the most part though, I rely on floss tosses for the most part because I really want the fabric color to accentuate and or enhance the design. So, and it also sometimes that plays into where, oh, if it's a girl in like a purple dress and I really like purple, um, I'll either pick a color that emphasizes the purple or complements it, um, but I try not to pick something that's like the same color so that everything blends in. And um, so let me show you the first project I've got here. This is a little one. I think I showed this to you guys last year when I bought it. So last year, uh, Shannon and Christine did uh, this little Halloween club. And there's eight designs in it, but I decided to go with this one because I, I don't know, I like the little alligator kid and the witch little witch kid and then I also like this come in for a spell that there's some beads on this one too I'm not taking any beading with me but um so yeah I mean she's got this pictured on kind of a neutral background I mean that would be okay but in my brain when I looked at that I thought it might be nice to do this on some kind of a green that's the first thing I thought of so I dove into my stash and I came up with this one right here so this is kind of a green and 
brown, kind of a creamy yellow, almost brown, very kind of neutral, more neutral than what I usually do. But again, there's green in this design in the little alligator and in the witch's hair. So I didn't want like the same green. I also considered purple possibly purple could have been good too, or like a charcoal gray or something. Um, something that suits the mood. This is a Halloween design. So I wanted something kind of spooky or gloomy. And, but the ultimate thing that I decide though is uh, the floss sauce. So here is all the floss. And I think it looks really good. It makes the colors pop. It complements everything. Nothing's blending in. These are all things that make me happy about a floss toss. I think it really makes the purple stand out. It makes the oranges stand out. The greens still stand out, even though this is green. So yeah, that's how I declare that a fabric win. I went ahead and cut this piece already. Um, this fabric, because I know people probably ask, is by a dyer that I get her stuff off um, eBay for the most part. Uh, I'll link her down below. Crazy Hamster is the name she puts on the labels now. But that's what those look like. And I cut two pieces because I might decide to jump around because these designs, while they are fairly simple, the floss list is fairly small. It is a little bit confetti-ish because like say in this letters, there's like three, a gradient of three colors in these letters. So there's a couple stitches here, couple stitches here, couple stitches here. And I may not want to carry it over. So that's going to be a lot of floss burying, you know. And then like there's colors up here and then it's colors down here. That's a lot of counting. So um, I picked a piece for both of these in case I get annoyed with one and I can switch to the other. Um, so yes, I'm planning on taking multiple pieces with me. It's stupid. I know there's no way I'm going to finish all of them in this short amount of time. It would not be out of the ordinary for me to not even touch any of them. That would be a me thing to do, <laughs> but I'm bringing myself some options. They're not going to take up a lot of space, you know, like I'm only traveling for a couple days, so I'm not going to need to take very much with me anyways. And most of what I'm taking is going to fit fairly nicely in just one of these things. So I can stick that in my carry on bag. No problem. That and a lot of these designs I want to do anyways, so why not get them up? So, thank you Kitchy Whips for the question. I hope that answered it. I know it's not quite a direct answer, but for the most part, I pick fabric that makes me happy and that I think makes the design look really awesome. So, and I, I also like to be a little unique. Like, I like picking a fabric like, ooh, no one else has stitched it on something like this, even though, you know, like, I'm sure other people have stitched it, you know, on things before, but I like to be a little different. Like if everybody is going for the same color for one design, I a lot of times don't want to use that color just because it's been done so many times, unless it's like just that awesome, you know, and I can't help myself. So kind of picky that way. But yeah, so I've got these two designs here and two pieces for them. And I need to bobinate the floss. I should mention too, I did a substitution on one of these flosses. Let's see here. So there was, is there another gray that I'm missing? Well, there's black. Let's just grab the black. So um, these colors here, got black, dark gray, light gray, white. This dark gray is a different one. It's slightly darker. It was way closer to this one, but I pulled out my uh, trusty old DMC catalog and let me show you. So the called for was, do, 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 where are you at? Am I looking at it wrong? Let me see. So we had 317, where are you at? Do, do, do. Okay, here we go. So this one was called for, this was the next one, and then this is the substitution I used. This, look, look how close these two are. I know you guys totally can't even tell on the screen there, but they're barely even a shade apart. So I kind of decided to go with this one because I, number one, had it in stash. And number two, I thought it's, because sometimes when you're doing gradients and you can't tell the difference between the two, it kind of annoys me a little bit. It's like, you can't even tell, and I had to switch threads and buy a whole new skein of floss just for this color. It would have been just easier just to do it all, you know? So I like that this kind of shows up a little bit better, but yeah, substitution. I don't think it's gonna 
make a huge amount of difference, but I thought I'd mention it at least. So I'll be bobbinating these up as we go along tonight. Okay. So next question is Kaylee Tent Stitch. Which of your FFOs is your favorite and which are you most proud of? Okay. FFO, in case you don't know, is a fully finished object. That's hard. Um, I am very fond of my Mermaid of the Pearls. Like, she took best of show in the fair this year. I'm happy with the fabric I did her on. I'm happy with the framing job. I'm happy with the beads. When I inspect her, I have to look really hard to find stitches that bug me. Like, aren't pretty looking. You know, like, I can look at that and the only thing that bothers me about it is that I didn't do her skin over one. But it was already stitched. This is back way before I was stitching all skin over one. And that's just a personal preference of mine. Um, my only issue with her is that I didn't do the skin over one. That's the only thing I would have changed about her. Um, but yeah, as far as fully finished, I think that, yeah, I think that'd be her um, most proud of. Gosh, my Taj Mahal is still at the framer. I'm sure when it comes back, I'll probably be the most proud of it. Or it'll be my favorite, either one. But... It's not back from the Kramer yet, but oh gosh, I can't wait. It's going to look so cool. Um, they sent me some pictures of like the mats to pick them out and I'm really happy with the mats. But of course I have no idea what they're going to do shape wise. I kind of left them to that. I didn't opt to add any embellishments to it because Taj Mahal Mandala by Shadlane is such a intricate design. There's a lot going on with it. I didn't want a lot going on with the mat. I picked four colors for the mats because I do like kind of, there's a lot of colors in that design and I stitched it on kind of an unusual fabric um, for that one. It was kind of, um, oh gosh, it was a crossed wing fabric, but it's basically like oceany blues and greens. I just thought it worked well for it. So I kind of picked the matting to complement the fabric, but also pick up colors from within design to kind of harm, harmonize everything. So, but I'm excited about that. And I'm sure that'll probably be a favorite once I get it. So but thank you, Kaylee Tent Stitch for the question. I was slightly worried I wasn't going to get any questions and I just have to like, I don't know, start talking about the shows I like to watch while I'm stitching, <laughs> which, you know, could probably talk about that too. Okay, let's see here. Next question. Um, before we go to the next question, let me show up something else that I'm going to be kidding up tonight just for funsies. This one was in the picture that I posted on Instagram. Let me show you the design first. This is a Chatelaine design. I've been dying to start it. This is the Halloween Kitty Mandala. Oh my God, look at all the fun Halloween-y spookiness. I am dying to start it. Here is the fabric I have chosen for it. A little bit wild, but I'm okay with that because <laughs> I like to be a little wild sometimes. That and when I looked at this design, just to kind of call back to Kitchy Whips, you know, how do you pick your fabrics question. When I looked at this, I was like, there's not a lot of purple in that. And purple is a very... First off, it's my favorite color. Second, it's a kind of Halloween-y color. There's a lot of green, there's a lot of black. So that threw out black, because if I stitch this on black, those cats are not showing up at all, or the witch hats. So I was like, black is out. Typically when I do like a spooky Halloween design, I like a darker color, but black was out because of that. There is, uh, hang on, making a mess. There is this little bit around here is kind of a bluey purple which let me show you that thread it's right here it's a very dark navy blue which is funny the color is called purple night sky and it's in my opinion more indigo than purple it's very dark not very purpley very much more blue in my opinion so i have been thinking of switching that one though yeah i'm probably gonna switch it because look at this um so there's a lot of dark purple in this design and look at this blue with it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's kind of too close in my opinion. So I've been shopping for a, a thread to maybe substitute it with. I did pull this thread out from um, the remnants of what I have left from Taj Mahal. But this one matches the fabric too much. Like, look at that. It's like a perfect match. So I was like, nope, that's not going to work. But when I picked up some floss, I also picked up this DMC variegated thread. And I like that because it's blue and purple and it changes. So that's fun. 
and it still kind of shows up on here now you know if it's going to be on like this green bit here it's going to show up just fine but if it comes over into the blue which that's another reason i like modeled fabrics you know because if it's blending in on one area especially a shad lane design which is repetitive it's going to fall over into another color and show up just fine so but i'm excited about this so here is this the right pile yeah this is all the floss there's lots of orange lots of yellows there is a lot of greens let me separate the greens this is another thing i do when i do floss tosses if my fabric has a lot of one color in it and there's that color present in the floss i like to separate them and toss it because you can bet that these colors are going to be right next to each other so i need to see how bad it's going to be so because there's a lot of dark greens i would say like probably this guy is the one that's in the most trouble of blending Maybe even eh, sometime, somewhere this one. But as long as all these colors are here, I think it'll still be fine. And like I said, like, so Chatelaine, it's going to cross over all these. So it's gonna look really cool here, but it might blend in when it gets to the greens and I'm okay with it. A lot of times I don't make choices like that when there's a lot of green in one design pick a fabric that has green in it like that's not something I typically do but still in my mind's eye I was like I'm really feeling like a green and purple and I knew several designers like fabric companies that had like a purple and green I kind of wanted that for it so I'm dealing with it but I don't typically do that all the time like I was thinking of just finding a nice purple for it but I wanted it to be different colors so that's just me being extra. <laughs> so I still need to cut this. I probably won't mess with the fabric um, in the next couple of days. I'm probably gonna wait till I get back from my trip just cause that's kind of a lot. But tonight we'd be bobbinating. So, alrighty. So next question, and I'm gonna get into bobbinating. So basically tonight what I'm bobbinating are these two piles and I'm going to keep them separate and also I typically when I bobbinate floss for a design I typically get it ready to put like in a bin but because both of these designs there's not really a lot of floss there's I'm not even going to halfway fill up one of them things so we're putting a ring on it all right, so I'm going to start with the Shannon Christine Halloween design first. Oh, one other quick thing. Here's another design that I'm thinking of taking with me just because there's only two colors in it and it's itty bitty. And if I'm in the mood for itty bitty, this might work. So this is, uh, what's it called? Is it called Boo? <laughs> Doesn't say what it's called. By the Prairie Schooler. But yes, yeah, just a little ghost, little moon, little pumpkin. It's black and orange. And I'm going to stitch it on this green. This is Conifer by Picture of the Spliss. Oh, sorry. I didn't tell you what name this fabric is. This is a pretty much solo from Be Stitch Me. I think they have a fabric called Haunted that looks very similar, though. Basically, it's purple and green. You know, whatever fabric you see on their website that's purple and green, it's, it's close to that. Okay, so let's get to bobbinating, and then we'll do another question. So how I bobbinate is I like to use the cardboard bobbins um, because recycling and not using too much plastic that and when I use plastic bobbins I don't like that when you if you use a sticker for the number it always flakes off eventually so I like these I can just write directly on them they're cheap they're they're quick and dirty they get the job done so I always use the cardboard bobbins so and then I just write the number on it I do typically <laughs> buy a whole new skein of floss for every project. Um, a lot of the projects I do are large, so a lot of times I need a full skein anyways. And I don't want to run out and have to worry about dye lot issues. Now here's one thing I do when I bobbinate. I like to open up the skein. Do, 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 do. And I know you can buy like winders, but I can wind it myself. I kind of put it on like a bracelet <laughs> and then I can kind of pull from here, which this one's a little wonky. So it's going to be a fun one for you guys to watch me tie myself up with. I can see where it's going. There we go. 
All right. So next question was ShareBear0607. Can you please film a separate video of your stitchy stretches? She's referencing um, some little bits of yoga that I threw in on a floss tube for crafters to keep their necks from getting stiff and stuff. Film a separate video of it and post it to YouTube so I can always find it. That was awesome and it really helped me love your videos. Thank you so much, Share Bear. I'm glad you found use from them. Uh, thank you for the question as well. Yes, I am totally planning on filming. I can film the stretches I showed there separately and I'm planning on doing more like kind of full body um, stretches because the ones I showed were kind of like chair yoga where you can just do it sitting in your chair which is nice if you're crafting, you know, you've been working for hours. It's nice to just stop, take a second, do some stretching, keep yourselves from deteriorating too much because we crafters are kind of rough on our neck and shoulders. So it's good to stop and refresh those. There's a knot in this, look at that. First one, there's a knot in it. That's kind of funny. Oh well, <laughs> I'll cut it later. <laughs> and then I wind away. <laughs> I'm my own winder. I don't mind it. So, um, but yeah, I'm also planning on doing like maybe a separate channel that's just like yoga and dance and stuff. I mentioned that in my last video. I'm probably going to um, do that before too terribly long because I'm really wanting to teach yoga again. It would be just so easy just to do a channel on it. That way I don't have to like split the cost with a studio or anything. But yeah. So, a next question is by Adventures in Cross Stitch. I like your name. It reminds me of Adventures in Babysitting. That was a fun 80s movie. First one down. <laughs> Long way to go. Okay, so Adventures in Cross Stitch. I always have trouble picking fabric and usually ending up going with the recommended fabric. How do you decide which color fabric to use? Do you pick a color that's in the design or something else? Thanks in advance. You're welcome in advance. Thank you for your question. And I know we kind of went over that a little bit, but I'm never tired of talking about how I pick fabric. <laughs> like I said before, um, I kind of go with whatever makes me happy. I don't like using recommended fabric because I don't like being told what to do. <laughs> that and I like to be different. You know, sometimes the recommended fabric, I feel like kind of everybody goes for that. Um, it's just one of the things, like, there is no wrong answer. Like, if you don't like a color, not even fabric, maybe floss, you know, just sub it. Like, the cross-stitch police are not going to knock on your door and say, ma'am, you use this color instead of that color. You know, that's a $50 fine, <laughs> you know, like, and it goes on your cross-stitching license for two years. Like, it's going on your wall, for the most part, unless you're giving it to someone else. If you're giving it to someone else, they are clueless, <laughs> especially if they're not a stitcher or a crafter or in general. It's what makes you happy. So use the fabric you like, use the threads you like, use beads instead of thread. Like me, I'm a sparkle whore. And if there's not much sparkle in it, I put it in there because that makes Lori happy. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, that's kind of what stitching's about. Give yourself permission to do that. Um, there are no rules for the most part. I mean, and it's what you want to get out of it too. Like I used to be very laissez-faire and, you know, screw all the rules. You know, I'm going to stitch how I want. And I used to like, when I first started out, I would cross my X's every which way because I was usually more interested in conserving floss. You know, like if one... If doing one leg would save me a smidgen of floss, I would do it. But I've gotten to the point now where I am kind of critical of my work. I like it to look fairly smooth and neat, you know, so I I stick to that rule for the most part now, but only because I want to. And it makes me happy to see my stitching look nice. So same thing with fabric, you know? And I understand too, like, cause I've got a whole hoard here of fabric. <laughs> that um, I have a hard time using because I'm trying to save it for the perfect design. And sometimes, you know, like say Chatelaines, they're very expensive kits. It's like, say this Halloween design, that's kind of a wild fabric piece. What if I start it and it looks crappy? Well, 
I don't have a problem. And usually I can, uh, if I start something and I'm not liking it, I give myself full permission to stop and start it on something else. I know that's annoying, especially if you're working with silks and stuff that are expensive and you don't want to waste them. But there's certain things you can do to help. Like for one thing you can do is use a fabric viewer. Use those for a rough estimate though, because like a fabric viewer, like um, I'll link one down below, but that's where they've taken a design and it's only certain designers. Uh, the one that I use definitely has Chatelaine's and Mirabilia's um, viewable, which I stitch a lot of those. And you can basically overlay the image on like a online image of the design with all the kind of where the fabric is showing kind of cut out. So it gives you kind of a gross idea of what would this look like on blue? What would this look like on purple? What would this look like on a rainbow ombre? You know, like it gives you a rough idea, but keep it as a rough idea. I can't tell you how many times I have done a fabric viewer floss toss, fallen in love with something, ordered the fabric, and the fabric looks nothing like it did in the picture on the viewer. <laughs> so that's why I say use it with a grain of salt. Also, the next thing I do, are floss tosses. So sometimes I might have on hand, you know, the fabric similar to what I saw in the viewer. And I try to get my hands on the floss first, you know, or silks or whatever it is. That way I can see in person how well do these colors go together. Cause sometimes like Mirabilas are notorious for having horrible pictures. Like you'll think, oh, she's wearing a gray dress, but it's actually like tanzanite or blue or silver or something like that. And you have to kind of see the floss to know, oh, you know, this has this many colors on it. It's not going to look good on this color or it will look good on this other color. So floss tosses are pretty much the most accurate way. But of course, to do that, you have to have the fabric and the floss in your presence. Another thing you can do <laughs> is stalk other people on Instagram and Hopefully they're nice and have posted what fabric they've used and you can kind of see, ooh, I love that fabric. And then you can cry when it's a solo or it's like some fabric company that's not designing anymore. I've done that many a times. So yeah, I creepy stalk everybody on Instagram and I am probably the number one question I'm asking on Instagram is, oh my God, what fabric is that? <laughs> you know? Keeping in mind too, just because they got a piece of fabric that looks a certain way, you could order it from the designer. And, and I'm by when I'm talking about fabrics like this, I'm basically talking about over dyes, you know, like fairly wild colored things. If it's like a solid color, you're more likely to get, you know, what you were looking for. But just because I tend to use those colors, that's what I'm meaning when I'm asking people what kind of fabric it is. If you like stitching on solid colors or from companies, Kind of messed up a little bit there we go i was backtracking <laughs> so like i would say probably like weeks dye works colors are fairly consistent i don't have very many of them but i you know they're usually pretty solid and very minimal modeling and usually just one color so if you're liking a fabric from them it's probably gonna look about right or some of the picture this plus like some of their solider colors like um conifer here that I just showed you. That one, it might be a little bit darker or lighter, but it's kind of the same value for the most part. But yeah, just keep in mind, just because you see what someone else has, doesn't mean you're going to get exactly the same thing, which is good and bad. It's bad because if it's amazing and the one you get isn't as amazing, it's a little bit of a letdown, but sometimes yours is even better. And because I'm real big on, I like my pieces to be very unique. You know, I like my fabrics to be very unique and you know, I just like things being different. So it's always fun when you get like a unicorn fabric that's just oh, perfect. All the stars align. All right, next question. Hang on, I gotta make sure I'm not missing one. There we go. Next question by Midnight Stitcher. Would you ever do a video showing speciality stitches, like a how-to? Thank you, Midnight Stitcher, for your question. Yes, that is in the plans. Look at this. 
Oh, yeah, see, one thread got all wonky. I can just pull on it and fix it. There we go. Oh, and I almost forgot there's something I'm going to do here, but let me answer your question first. Yes, I am definitely planning on doing a how-to on speciality stitches. Um, kind of picky on which ones I'm doing them on, though. Um, I'm definitely doing one on, like, road stitches, eyelets, um, Jessica stitches. Um, those type of stitches kind of have a similar uh, mechanic. To them and I love it because I it's mon monotonous but my favorite speciality stitch is the road stitch because they look like little velvet pillows <laughs> you know and oh, you just want to touch them but you can't <laughs> especially if they're done with silk and they have that lovely sheen to them but yes I am planning on doing a video for that and demonstrating it but I will say I do not feel like I'm an expert on speciality stitches I mean I've done a fair few of them um, Teresa Wensler usually has a lot of eyelets and stuff in her designs on the borders especially uh, Victoria Sampler tons of speciality stitches they're also a great resource which is kind of why I feel like I don't know I shouldn't be acting like I'm an authority on it because psh, you know they've kind of banked on that so I'll leave a link down below for Victoria Sampler's website. They have a really good resource for um, how to speciality stitches. Also finishing like fully finished objects like scissor fobs and um, Biscor News, like frame designs. Like they are just a wealth of information. They also have like little mini kits, like especially like if you're learning how to do Hardinger, they have these like 10 step how to do Hardinger kits that are, I can't remember what they cost, but basically each kit, you finish an ornament, like sized piece, and it teaches you one like new stitch for the most part, or trick for Hardinger. And that's how I learned how to do Hardinger, was I ordered several of those kits. And then once I got the hang of the basics, um, when I would do like a Victoria Sampler design, they incorporate a lot of Hardinger into their designs. Once I had like, I don't know, steps one, one through five or one through six, I can't remember. I didn't buy all of them because by the time I had gotten through like step five, I could just kind of look at it at another one and be like, oh, okay, I see how they did that. You know, once you kind of get the basics, you can kind of improvise from there. So they are a wealth of information that I highly recommend. Um, I will link them down below. But yes, I will do a speciality stitches video. I'm looking forward to it because I really love speciality stitches. I need to also do a video on over one. I've been asked that several times and I am planning on doing it. It's just over one stitches are not my favorite. <laughs> I just love the payoff from converting skin to over one so much that I find it worth the effort to suffer through stitching over one and converting um, over two um, stitches to over one. That I put up with it but yeah there are a few tricks to it um, if you've never done it before gosh this one's a mess it'd be hard to keep this one straight but yeah that video is coming uh, soon I kind of would rather film it before the over one video but I kind of feel like I've been promising to do the over one video first uh, this one's probably gonna be messy but let's 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 just do it <laughs> so um, real quick, before I go into any other questions, which you know, there's only like one or two left. Well, I, th I don't think the last one's got like two questions in it though. Um, since I like to iron my threads, and I should say more specifically, there are like issues with, um, I'm not taking any scissors on the airplane. I know there are some rules with like, Oh, as long as the blade part is under so many inches, it should be fine. But let me tell you, the last few times I have flown, TSA has been on me. And, like, I got a bag of sand confiscated from me that I collected from the beach. They almost took my coffee, too. <laughs> so, I can imagine a pair of scissors. I'm not feeling generous and wanting to give them a pair of my scissors. So, I'm going to be bringing um, nail clippers, for the most part and using that but I don't um, 
relish the idea of cutting this with toenail clippers. I know it can be done, but I can just imagine it's going to make the ends kind of ugly. <laughs> so what I'm planning on doing is pre-cutting a length of thread and wrapping this on it. So that way the first few bits that I grab while I'm on the plane, I probably won't have to cut at least off of this once I'm stitching and I have my ends, I'm going to have to cut those, but then that's two threads, not six. So that's going to be less of an issue that. And if I really wanted to, I could just leave the ends hanging and clip them later. We'll see <laughs> what tends to happen when I travel and bring stitching with me is I tend to get into doing too much stuff traveling and then not even touch the stitching, which kind of made me like, you know, is it worth it for you to bring all this? But again, like I said, it's a quick trip. Uh, it's not going to take up much room in my bag. So why not? That and that whole first day, I was hoping to do something in Austin, Texas, but it's a Sunday. So a lot of things are closed. So it'll just be me and my stitching. And I am not above holding up in a hotel room and doing nothing. Like, I'm okay with that. I don't feel like I have to go and do something. It could just be my day off in another state so yeah last question was by midnight stitcher would you ever do a video showing speciality stitches how to i'm sorry i just asked that one i'm so dumb she had two questions so that was her first question the second question <laughs> when you are changing out mill hills for delica beads what do you do when you can't find a good substitution and would you ever use both on one piece? The answer to that last question is yes. <laughs> I do mix up Delicas and Mill Hills for roughly two reasons. One is I prefer the shape of the Mill Hill, like say Mermaid of the Pearls up there. I kept some of the Mill Hills because they were meant to look like pearls and Mill Hills are more rounded in nature. So that looks more like a pearl instead of picking like a more square shaped Delica. So she has Mill Hill, Delica, and Freshwater Pearls on her, like real freshwater pearls. So yeah, I'm totally open to mixing. I actually like mixing because it creates a lot of di different interesting textures, you know? Unless like there's certain designs that I'm stitching where I want like uniformity, like this, the beads are really close to each other, like in a lot of Chatelaine centers. Then I definitely want Delicas because they fit more tile-like, you know, and they're not crowding each other and giving me crowding issues and it just looks more uniform um there are sometimes when i i mean delica has a very large colors like there's more delica colors than there are mill hill but there are some there's times uh, i think when i was working this lady back here queen amphitrite there is one she has Mill Hill in her list and I'm converting her, but there is one Mill Hill color that I really like. And so far I have not found a Delica that it, it's more the, um, the shine of it. Like it's kind of, I don't know, it's just a cool color. And I haven't found something that I like for um, Delica to substitute it with. So I might just use it, which, you know, I, again, I do what makes Lori happy when it comes to stitching. <laughs> so if I like this color better, yeah, I'm going to use it. I don't care that they're not all Delica, which they're not all going to be Delica because some of the beads, like there's some crystals. There's a couple beads that are like larger size that I'm not going to find in a Delica. So yeah. And especially with her, cause she's got like a sandy bottom here and there's lots of like beads that are kind of goldy looking like pieces of gold, almost a couple pearls and stuff. For those type shapes, I'm not going to want the square Delica. I'm going to want more round like Mill Hill shape. So yeah, I have a lot of fun with combining them. I substitute them mostly because I just prefer Delica. I find that the finish lasts longer on them. I do have a couple designs that I've stitched with Mill Hill beads, like gold ones specifically, and I find the finish coming off on them. That's no fun. I haven't noticed that so much happening with Delica so far. I also haven't been stitching with Delicas as long as I have Mill Hill, so time will tell, I guess. But yeah, I, if I like one better, I will use it. I 
think that's pretty much the theme of tonight. You know, Lori does what Lori wants. And I encourage y'all to do what you want because it is your stitching. You're the one putting the work into it. Even if you're giving it to someone else, you should be the one that's happy with it. We're down to four colors, including this one. So I'm not doing too bad. And we're through most of the questions, but I thought, you know, we could talk about a few other things, at least while I finish this pile here. I didn't plan for this video to go too terribly long, but hopefully someone else is kidding something up and we're kind of kidding things up together. That's fun. Fun to think about. Alrighty. So, um, I thought I'd talk about what do I usually do when I'm kidding stuff up? A lot of times I will watch floss tubes. Um, because especially when people are very like a whip parade where I feel the need to look, I don't like listening slash watching whip parades when I'm stitching because I have to, I feel the need to keep looking away from my stitching and then you end up just watching instead of stitching. So I like to do like whip parades and stuff while I'm doing this because I can watch while doing this for the most part. Um, I also like stitching in general, watch a lot of serial killer documentaries, <laughs> um, because again, usually those type of documentaries, you don't have to really watch them. Uh, especially if, you know, if you're kind of a nerd and you like a psychology nerd, I guess that's, I feel like the most type of us who like watching serial killer type documentaries. Um, it's usually old footage that you've probably seen already. You know, so you don't need to watch, you know, and it's usually some person talking the whole time. I'm a big documentary fan, but, uh, yeah, I like serial killer documentaries. <laughs> um, I also like, um, watching Hell's Kitchen. Uh, Gordon Ramsay cracks me up. Um, I'm here for the cursey words. And he, uh, a lot of times that show... If you watch that show, it's just people shaking pans the whole time. So you don't need to watch that. And then Gordon will invariably, if there's something worth looking at, you're going to hear him say, look at this shit, you know? So then you can look, you know, when you hear him say that and still keep stitching. So I've probably watched probably every season of Hell's Kitchen while stitching just because like, oh my God, and there's so much drama. Like who knew? I've never worked in the food industry. I feel like I've learned so much just watching that show. Though one downfall to kind of listening slash watching that show is it almost always makes me want to go and make something. <laughs> like um, I start getting hungry because some of the food looks really good. <laughs> um, I'll sometimes watch movies too. You know, I'm one of them people that I will watch the same movie over and over again. I've probably seen Jaws a million times, Aliens a million times. Um, horror movies, I love horror movies. Um, like the classic 80s ones, like the Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Chucky, or Child's Play. Um, I like all that. And I also love other... Oh, kind of artsy movies like Memoirs of a Geisha. I love that movie, but the problem is I will start watching that movie because that movie, you can tell someone that had a dance background filmed or directed that movie because it's got very dancey type transitions. So that movie is just pretty to watch. So that one, I don't typically put that one in, but I like movies like that. But even though I've seen it a million times, like I will still just sit and watch them. But I try to put in movies that I can just listen to for the most part. And one reason I like 80s horror movies is I like watching them to laugh at them because, you know, the dialogue is kind of cheesy and cringy, you know? So a lot of times I don't even need to watch anything. I can just sit here and laugh, you know, at the things that people say to each other. I also love watching um, video game playthroughs of games that I've already played before. Um, my favorite game is Resident Evil, so I like watching people play those, especially if they're playing the old school tank control ones and uh, they're walking into walls and stuff. Now, that usually gets me into trouble because then I start watching, you know, because <laughs> there is a skill to it. But especially if someone's used to the modern analog controllers nowadays, 
which I don't do too good with. It usually makes me a little seasick. I'm used to using, you know, a thumb to walk, but now like you have to use two fingers, one to walk and one to change the direction that you're facing slash walking. So it usually makes me a little seasick because I'm used to side scrollers or tank controls. I'm kind of an old nerd when it comes to like gaming stuff but i like watching the old game kind of for the same reason i like watching old horror movies the dialogue is so cheesy that it's just so funny you know like <laughs> you were almost a jewel sandwich <laughs> like if you get that reference because you are cool <laughs> but um yeah so that's usually what i'll do is i'll watch that stuff um i will also <laughs> watch some floss tubers on repeat um a lot of times i will have formerly known as married with stitches but now fortnite fabrics um derek and christian they crack me up so i like listening to them in the background um i will have kyle reichemeyer playing over again because i think he's funny um i found a couple new floss tubers too I can't remember. I'm terrible with names. If you watch my channel, you know I suck with names. So since they're new to me, I definitely don't know their names. It takes me a couple goes. Um, one of them, though, I think her name is Buckeye Stitcher. Obviously, she's also in Ohio, so I picked up on her recently. So, but again, I have to be careful with watching floss tubers because then I end up watching and not stitching. But I can do them while I'm doing this, so... That's what I would typically be doing if I wasn't talking to you guys right now. All right, so this is the last color for this group. And I think we will call it a night because I do need to get to bed. I haven't started packing for the trip. I need to finish doing laundry for work tomorrow. I am working up until Saturday, so I don't have a single full day off until the night that I leave. And I have to drive a fair bit to the airport and my flight leaves at seven in the morning. So that means I need to get at the airport by five-ish, 5.30ish, which means I need to get in the car around four o'clock. So that's not gonna be fun, but that gives me very little time to like finish the usual things you need to do before you leave on a trip. Cause I gotta run to the grocery, make sure the kid and the pets have enough food to survive while I'm gone. <laughs> so, I do have one more thing to show you guys though. Maybe you can see it in the background. The last video, I had my black orchid in bloom, my catacetum type orchid. She was really cool. Um, her buds have fallen off since, but once she started blooming, I realized I had a bud for one of my cat layers, which is super exciting for me because I've had, I have three cat layers. I've had more before. I've had a lot of orchids before, but a lot of them caught a virus of some kind and croaked on me. But I have three Cattleyas because I love the foliage on them. They're so robust and thick and the flowers are amazing. But I have not until now successfully bloomed a Cattleya. Um, I have bought Cattleyas that were already in bud and had them bloom. But this is the first bloom that I can take credit for because not only did she bloom on my watch, but this entire growth that the buds coming out of grew on my watch. So that is my flower. I created it. I'm probably going to do this. I'm going to have to put these in order first before I put them on the ring. I like having them in numerical order. Otherwise I get twitchy. So but let me show you my orchid real quick. She's quite pretty. Do, 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 do. And she's in a very janky container right now. It keeps her happy. So she's kind of a big girl. This is a RLC, which stands for, if I'm not mistaken, Rinko Lelia Catlia. Don't ask. I'm going to nerd out. <laughs> okay, here she is. Isn't she pretty? So this is a Catlia. They're known for being the big kind of classic orchid. You know, she does have a fragrance. But what's interesting about cat layers is you don't really, they mostly put their fragrance out in the morning. So I'll smell her in the morning, but right now I can't smell too much. 
but isn't she pretty? And her name is the Amazing Thailand. And isn't she so pretty? And these plants are cool because they put out all the, she's kind of got a BDSM restraint system here because she likes to go all over the place. So that's where all this stuff comes from. But they will put off a growth and then that growth puts out a sheath. And as you can see, this is the last growth I had. Hang on, let me try and make this work. So this is the last one and she put out a, a flower sheath, but no bud came out of it. And I did grow this one. Actually, I think it might've been growing when I got her. No, I think this one came when I got her. But yeah, this one never put out a flower sheath, which is usually what happens when I have cat layers. I can get flower sheaths, but no bud comes out of it. So this was the first time I actually got a flower, so I'm so proud. I did switch fertilizers. I got a blooming fertilizer, um, thinking it had a low middle number, like the nitrate level or something. I'll have to check. If you're interested, let me know. This might be totally boring for you guys. So sorry if it is. But isn't she so pretty? I'm so proud of her. Proud plant mom. <laughs> Grow, damn it. <laughs> so yeah, um, she's probably going to need repotted soon. She's getting ready to crawl out of her pot. I did repot her last year i think before this thing was where it was now let me see i don't even know if you guys can see this but the orchids put out what's called eyes and that's where another one of these things can pop out and it's probably under all this sheathing here but it will put out another one of these and then roots will drop from it so if you're not careful it will walk out of the edge of the pot which is pretty common in the orchid world because they're epiphytes, which means they're air plants. And a lot of times the roots like to be free in the air to absorb moisture from humidity more so than water being dumped on them. But anyways, this is my lovely, amazing Thailand Cattleya orchid. I'm very proud. Sheep purdy. <laughs> but anyways, thanks so much, you guys, for watching. I will catch you guys next time. I will probably film another floss tube before um, before Halloween, but after I come back and maybe you guys can see my new tattoo or at least the start of it. We're thinking it's going to take a couple trips to get it in, but I'll let you guys know once I get back because I won't know until then. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for submitting your questions on Instagram. It's much appreciated, and I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.